55. Starting in December, Fishing the DMV will be cutting back to only airing one episode per week until we hit our first Patreon goal of 100 Patreon supporters. We are only 55 members away from achieving our first goal. For less than a pack of Cinco's or buying a jackhammer chatterbait, you can help support the show. Patreon supporters will receive a special monthly discount off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Again, that's a special monthly discount off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Access to a private Facebook group community. They'll be entered into weekly prize giveaways with the winner being announced during Monday Night Live. They'll have access to special members only videos and live streams, part of monthly competitions that we put on, and so much more. Again, we are only 55 members away from achieving our goal. And once we achieve it, we'll be putting out more and more episodes each week. If you would like to support the show and join us on Patreon, link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today I have a special guest, uh, Nathan Updike, who is the winner of the N- NVKBA, that's a big-ass acronym, NVKBA Rookie of the Year points after a 2023 season. Uh, Nate, Nathan, how are you doing tonight? Good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Um, we were just talking before we started to started recording here. Just really kind of what got you into this. I mean, I, winning Angler of the Year is one thing. Rookie of the Year to me is completely different because it it's, it's, it's your first soiree into this whole thing. It's your first go. You can be an old veteran and win Angler of the Year, which is awesome. But there's something even cooler about the story when it's like it's your first crack at the apple and you hit Rookie of the Year. Yeah, it was a, I had myself in a decent spot to actually have a chance at AOI. I was leading AOI going into the Classic and then just completely bombed at the Classic. It was by far the worst event of the year. I kind of had a love-hate relationship with Lake Ann, especially during the fall. So, so I mean, let's just go through it. Like before we get into it, tournament by tournament. I mean, what got you into kayak fishing? So I grew up like a lot of people. Right, I live out in Front Royal, and I grew up like a lot of people out in Front Royal, just kind of river rat fishing the Shenandoah River. Um, my parents owned a lot on the South Fork, and that was pretty much like what I knew. A lot of it was honestly just like wade fishing, and a lot of it was if I had a kayak, half the time was just tethered to me. It's basically a way to store some tackle and some extra rods and just kind of like wading around and for probably until the last like four or five years where I really started getting into, you know, kind of exploring a little bit more. And then it was four years ago, I bought my first boat, which was uh, one of the old fiberglass trackers. It was 16 foot. And I bought that, started exploring like the Riverton area a lot more. I bought one of the Lake Holiday lots, started going up at Lake Holiday, got more into doing some largemouth stuff too. Um, and then it was, Bought that big boat and realized there wasn't a ton of places to, to fish with a big boat around here. So kind of went back to kayak fishing a little bit more after that. And I uh, ended up buying one of the cheaper Ascend kayaks, fished out of that for a couple of years. And then this year was uh, my first year really getting into uh, legitimate kayak fishing. It was a, uh, I bought my new kayak this year. And the first time I dropped it in the water was Lake Anna <laughs> tournament morning. It got delivered, but <laughs> it got delivered the, the night before. It was supposed to be delivered like a month before and kept getting delayed, kept getting delayed. Finally got it uh, that day and then uh, stayed up till about 2.30 in the morning trying to get it rigged up for uh, late in the morning. <laughs> so it was definitely an adventure tournament morning. First time that guy had ever been in that kayak and uh, first time messing with any of that rigging. So there were definitely some issues uh, tournament morning that slowed things down a little bit. You might have already mentioned it, but what was the, the, the badass kayak that you had this year that, that, that led you to victory? So this year I upgraded to uh, Three Waters Big Fish 120. It's uh, not a super expensive kayak. It's just a paddle kayak. Um, I do have a trolling motor set up on it. Um, I ended up with a trolling motor set up on that ascent, but it was just not ideal. It really was, I was pushing the limits of that kayak with a, a trolling motor on it. Um, this one, it's, I, I don't think you can buy a better kayak for $1,000. Like I, I'm not sponsored by them or anything like that. I paid 950 bucks for it it's kind of a barge out on the water if you don't have a trolling motor and uh you're fishing a lot of current you're gonna hate your life a little bit but if you've got a motor or if you're fishing a lot of smaller lakes and uh you know you don't have to make any like long runs if you don't have a trolling motor i mean it's it's incredibly stable i mean i stood up you know the majority of my first day on lake anna and i was fishing down lake you know in one of the most open parts of lake anna and decent waves and, and never been on that kayak before and it, felt stable enough to me where I felt comfortable doing that. So, Dang. Wow. Well, what, what, what type of trolling motor were you running? 
So right now I just have uh, one of the 36 pound thrusts. It's just, it would be just a standard tiller, a uh, Newport Vessels one. And then it's just a lot of DIY rigging. I've got that set up with the foot controls. And then I have a, a PWM set up by my seat to control the, the speed on it. So it's a lot of DIY. It was a lot of stuff that I had rigged up on the Ascend that I just kind of, for the most part, plugged and played over to the new kayak. I mean, you know, sometimes that's all you got to do is guts and nuts it. Cause I mean, I do like the Torquedo and the Newport stuff. I've seen, you know, countless professionals do it, but I mean, unless I get a white win the lottery or something, you know, three and a half grand, that's, that's pretty, that's a heck of a price tag to, to invest into it. Yeah. I think at some point I'll probably upgrade to either a Torquedo or kind of Newport's version of their Torquedo at some point. But I fished this entire year using that. And, uh, this last time in Lake Anna, when we went there for the classic, I did 17 miles with, uh, in my kayak, which is one of the reasons why I didn't do so well is I made a long run, had a bad idea, and then had to make a long run back out. Um, but just with that 36 pound thrust and I have a hundred amp hour, uh, like Amazon lithium battery and I still have juice left at the end of the day. So I got another bad lithium. Huh. How much of that, how much that battery cost? Uh, so I just have one of the Amazon ones and I haven't had any issues with it. I paid high 200, low 300 for a hundred amp hour. Oh shit, dude, that's not bad at all. Mm -mm. No, my only complaint with it is, is uh, you spend a little bit more, you can get ones that have like the Bluetooth monitoring system on it. I don't have that, so I'm kind of just winging it. Oh, <laughs> I've kind of figured out, you know, where I can push the limits, and I don't, I don't run it on a hundred a ton. Um, and that's one of the cool things about the the PWM is it's got the dial zero to hundred. You can set it right where you want it to. Um, and one of the cool things about that is you can almost kind of use it as mini spot lock just face up current really get that dialed into where you want it to be and just with you keep your nose pointed in the current you can really hold pretty well just super super minor adjustments with the the foot pegs on it that's freaking awesome i mean i mean so then heck let's just drop right into it then so lake anna first tournament of the year and that's kind of funny because it bookends kind of the year in general but you're up till 2 a.m you get dumped on the water What's going through your head? Is it just like, I just want to not sink. I just want to survive this tournament Basically, and just yeah. get to the next one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I had a lot of questions with my rigging at that point, I think more than anything. And there was definitely a few things with, uh, cause like I said, I, I don't have something that you buy out of the package and you slap it on the back. And even though, you know, you go buy a Torquedo, like there's going to be some DIY rigging with, with a lot of this stuff. Right. But so I had a little bit of some questions with that and some of my, had some issues later on. I actually got about a 30 minute late uh, head start just because I ended up kind of at the ramp messing around with some stuff, getting some stuff kind of dialed in a little bit better with some of the, the foot steering. Um, and then I had one of the issues with the way I had uh, my battery mounted too. So I had to kind of rework that all at the ramp. Dude, Jesus. That's insane. So you get out there. How did you do that tournament? So I, I had a good tournament that one. I, uh, I prefished one day and uh, I prefished only down lake it was kind of doing some weird stuff weather wise and it was kind of going in right to the spot where i thought there would be some pre-spawn fish but with the weird weather i thought some of that muddier water uh kind of up lake like up the splits i thought those fish might be in a little bit of a wonky mood and so I, I fished down lake where the water's a lot clearer hoping that those fish would be a lot more stable um and that day that i pre-fished um i found a lot of small males they weren't on beds but they were starting to push up shallow and then I, uh, I was not really getting bit. Like I fished for like my first four hours without a bite. And it was, uh, I don't remember if it was you talking about it on this podcast. I know I heard it on your podcast, but going out and throwing a glide bait almost as just kind of like forward facing phone or sonar, just trying to see if you're around fish. And I did that. And like my first one, I had like three or four around 14 inches followed in. And I was mostly working like a rip rap, rip rap bank and just kind of went down that bank, throwing that glide bait and, I moved a ton of fish and I'm like, all right, I'm around fish. I'm just not doing something right. And eventually slowed down, started catching them, um, dragging a football jig, caught a few on a jerk bait, working it really slow with some decent pauses in between. Um, and started picking up fish and then I was like, all right, this is where I'm going to go. And then uh, we'll hope for the best tournament morning. Really only fished it for like about an hour with a handful of bites. But with the amount of fish I saw on the, just following that glide bait, I felt confident that I was at least in the area with fish. That's always surprising to me because as you get more and more technology, you kind of lose those old traits. And I was thinking about this two weeks ago when I was pre-fishing for a tournament on the upper, the big slack, which is triangulating. Like no one teaches that anymore. Even though I have 360 and forward facing center on my boat, I still look for a doctor saying to triangulate. And it's the same thing with that. Like in college, when we would go down to brand new lakes, you throw a bluegill or a glide bait uh, and you probably wouldn't catch anything. You probably take the hooks off, but it's just so you know 
what fish, you know, what docks had fish under them. And it's crazy that I don't think people do that anymore or, or they don't talk about it because you do a forward facing center. That's a skill that has been lost because of technology. Yeah. And then it was, uh, so tournament morning, I went to that same stretch of riprap and I worked, I worked that stretch of riprap for probably the first like three hours. And I got a handful of bites. I lost one really good one on a Nico rig, caught one on a football jig. And then uh, I was like, it was my first tournament. I only had like one uh, that I had that was a keeper. So I'm like, I saw all those males up shallow. Let me just go up shallow, try and see if I can leash catch a limit. And then I'll dump back out deeper, go back to dragging a football jig and uh, try and see if I can kind of make some calls and upgrade from there. And that's what I did. And it, it definitely uh, screwed me over a little bit in that tournament because it was, man, I went into this cove and I have never seen more small bass schooled up than what I had saw in this one cove. Oh, and I just had it with a drop shot. And I have no idea how many I caught. It was at least 30. And it was, they were all between 10 to like 11 and a half. And then I would get one that'd be 12, another one that'd be 12. And then go back to another set of, you know, 10 to 15, 9 to 11 inches. And then eventually I think I caught, I think I caught three or four out of that cove. But I mean, I was catching fish like almost every other cast and just putting them all on the board. They were all so close. And I'm like, I'm going to catch a limit like this. I'm not going to do anything. There's no signs of anything better out here. Let me dump back out a little bit deeper. And then, uh, there was one big rock point that kind of was on the outside of that spawning cove. And uh, that's when I started catching bigger fish. Um, almost immediately going back off of that, uh, I landed one that was 20 and a quarter. Um, had another one that I think was 18 or 19, lost another good one. And then I, I milked that rock point for the entire rest of the day, all the way up until a, a pontoon went uh, trolling for stripers right in front of me. And then I backed off and tried to do some other things for a little bit. And then uh, went back to that rock point for a little bit and caught one more. Um, I think it was like 14 or so, kind of right at the end. But I, I didn't move a ton in that tournament. I kind of went back and forth and left my spot, went and fished up shallow for a little bit, and then came right back to that same big, long rock point that was right on the outside of that spawning cove. Did did the time of year help? Because uh, Lake Anna is notorious as being a forward-facing sonar lake, like a lot of like Aquacon Reservoir. And being you know in that April time period, if this tournament was a little bit earlier, I mean, do you think it would have been won predominantly by guys with forward facing sonar? I, I don't think you would have been able to just sit on a spot like I did. I don't know if you would necessarily, you know, need forward facing sonar, but I don't think you would get them because they were thinking about going up shallow. Like they were in kind of that last step before they really started up shallow at all. Um, especially I think Lake Anna, from what I've seen, I feel like they spawn a little bit earlier on Lake Anna with that water being a little bit warmer than some of the other bodies of water too. Uh, so they were definitely thinking about moving up. There was nothing on beds, but they were kind of in that last staging spot before they started pushing up shallow. And then once I saw all those males up shallow, but not even on beds, I really assumed those, the bigger females would be out just a little bit deeper. Um, so that's, you know, there were definitely a lot of females out staging on that last point before they could push into that spawning cove. I mean, a sixth place, not too shabby. I mean, first event, you just got the brand new kayak. You probably are feeling really good going into... You, you know, the next event on the Potomac river, uh, I think that was, that was still in April. Yeah. That was late April, I think. So you're going into that event. What is your experience on that part of the river? Uh, so I have, those were, I had fished the first three bodies of water that we had been on that I'd never been on any of the other ones. So I had a little bit of experience on Anna kind of hit or miss. I've never been overly consistent on it. That tournament was honestly probably my best day I've ever had on Anna up to that point. Um, the Potomac, I, uh, so I had an old bass boat and then I upgraded two years ago and I didn't really trust taking my old bass boat out on the Potomac. So I really didn't get out there, um, in, uh, in a bass boat, um, until about a couple years ago. And it was usually a couple times a year, nothing extensive. You know, I kind of ran a lot of the community holes, run into Madawoman, run into Belmont, stuff like that. I didn't have any sneaky stuff or anything like that. Just fishing a lot of the community holes. Um, and then other than pre-fishing for this tournament, I'd never been on it in a kayak. Um, which was definitely a, a different environment um, with uh, as much as that place gets crowded, you know, tournament morning. I, I don't think I was ever more than, uh, you know, 40 yards away from at least three other kayaks. I mean, we were all crammed in there together. Um, but being that most of my experience was kind of in Madawoman and Belmont Bay, I was kind of debating going uh, which one I wanted to go to. And then uh, Smallwood State Park was actually closed for a tri triathlon. And there's one other uh, ramp. A little bit further up, it's uh, 
I forget the name of it. I know it starts with an S just a little bit further up in Madawan. Yeah, back to the left, I think, yeah. if you're going up in there. Yeah, so yeah. I knew there was one back up there, but I figured with the other one, with the state park being closed, that ramp would probably be a mess, and that area would probably just be packed. So I'm like, I'm just going to go launch out of the Aquaquan, and I'll try and go into Belmont. It was still early. I pre-fished one day in Belmont, and I was getting bit. The grass was still really sparse, but I was able to find a few spots where it was up a little bit higher. And then I caught some off of some of the isolated wood and off a few of the docks in Belmont. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to go to the Aquaquan and uh, try and go into to Belmont Bay. How much of a, how much are you troller motoring out? So when I think of Belmont Bay, I'm either coming across from Mattawoman, I'm launching back near Aquaquan Reservoir, or I'm at Lisavania. Those are the three places from a boat I'm launching. And so in my mind, that's a hell of a putt on a trolling motor to get to, to Belmont Bay proper. How much of a drive was it for you to get there? And how much did that cut into your fishing time? It wasn't too bad. I, I, I launched, you were allowed to launch. I, I found one, I think there was restrictions on how early you can launch. I don't believe that one was an open launch because it was a uh, part of the KBF uh, event as well. Um, but you were allowed to launch at least a little bit early. I don't remember exactly how much it was. So by the, about the time it was lines in, I was, I could see the mouth of the Aquaquan at that time. And uh, when I pre-fished at Belmont Bay, it looked pretty good. Like it was sparse grass, but I was finding some fish in that grass. And then I got to the mouth of the Aquan tournament morning and I don't know what happened in Belmont Bay, but I mean, it was just, it was straight chocolate milk floating debris all over the place. And then it was, I don't know if other people kind of had that same strategy. And then it just seemed like there was about 40 kayaks and about 15 bass boats that all ended up just stacked on top of the pads right at the end of uh, the Aquan going into Belmont Bay. Um, so I fished those on my way out and uh, that was the, only tournament of the year where it's just like my execution was just like just horrible. It was, you know, I had fish flopping off the board. I had fish like in my hands that I was like missing, grabbing, missed one at the net. I mean, it was, I wouldn't have won that tournament, but I only ended up with uh, two keepers uh, that I scored in, but I had two that I had on the board that I didn't get a photo of. And then I had another one right at the boat that I lost and just, just poor execution in that tournament overall. Um, but it was, I definitely got a little spun out like when I wanted to go into Belmont and I really didn't have a backup. Like I had backups in Belmont, but I did not have a backup to Belmont. <laughs> so I kind of ended up just dumping in where everybody else was at and just kind of sharing a lot of pads with a, with a ton of people. Um, and caught them on a little bit of everything. Uh, I caught some on a, a spinner bait, caught some on a chatter bait, or at least hooked some on a spinner bait, hooked some on a chatter bait, caught some flipping some of the edges and uh, caught one really big snakehead way back in the pads. Um, but it was, a, it was definitely a, not a great tournament for me. I think I ended up with like 40 something out of, I think it was like 80 some people fishing that one. It was a, my worst regular season event. Yeah. I was like, I was literally trying to pull that up on, um, on the app to try to get the, the standings for that, for that event. That's the one I don't have up. Uh, and it's so weird because with Belmont, it is hit or miss. I feel like Matta woman, generally speaking is safe. The, I mean, yeah, you can get bad muddy water too, but that's generally safe. Pohick, same thing, but, but Belmont, it, that thing can get muddy in a hurry. I think it's cause it's just so open. It's such an open fish bowl compared to all the other ones, but you survived and you get to drop the lowest tournament. So that's a good shake it off moment. And you get a little bit of a breather about a month off until we get into the bronze back challenge, which I'm ashamed. I really sucked. I had to miss it this year. But so we get to the bronze back challenge. What is your mindset? Are you going to stay close to home? Are you thinking about venturing out? And this is in your backyard. Yeah. Well, so the, the main stem of the Shenandoah River is actually in my front yard. I actually live waterfront on the main stem now oh, dope. For, uh, last year. Um, but most of my experience up to this point was really on the South Fork. And it was a uh, the river lot that my parents had was in the front royal section section of the South Fork. And that was, you know, I, I fished that section so hard for probably like 20 years of my life. Um, and you have to launch out of a public ramp. So I was like, I debated going to the ramp up above it and then floating to the ramp below that and really slowing down, hammering that section that I, I knew pretty well. Um, and that was kind of my first plan. And then my second plan is being that I live on the section of the river now on the main stem. I know that section pretty well too. And uh, I pre-fished both of them for one day and I, I ended up with about kind of the same limit, but I was, you know, the, the quantity of fish is so much higher on the South Fork that it was, I didn't trust the gamble of going to the main stem because I only pre-fished for about four hours in front of my house, but I think I only had about seven bites and they were all decent fish. The overall quality was better, but the day that I fished the South Fork for about that stretch, you know, I had 
30, 40, 50 fish, somewhere in that range for about the same amount of, of total inches. So I'm like, I feel like this is a safer bet. I'm going to go on the South Fork. So I did a float on the South Fork in, uh, in Front Royal. That's really hard because when you live next to something, I feel like the voices in your head really start to play about where to go. And there were so many competitors. And I've, I probably said this on a couple of shows by now, but the Shenandoah is just getting better. When you look at kayak scores, guides and stuff where, you know, when, when I first, you know, I think it was two years ago when I, when I fished the Bronzeback Challenge uh, with MVKBA, and a lot of guys said, like, it used to always be one on the wrap. And now you're seeing more and more people, they're winning it off the Shenandoah or finishing extremely high. And so I guess this is a two-part question I have for you. One is, how hard was it to say, I'm not going to fish the main stem when you have so much history on it? And two, how many competitors did you see or talk to either before the tournament or during it? I didn't see a single person fishing my section of river. I got out pretty early. That one had an uh, open launch where you could launch a lot earlier. And the ramp that I launched at, I wanted to kind of get to that spot that I had so much experience on. So I started my launch. I mean, it was pitch black floating down the river for a while. I'm just trying to get to that area that, uh, a little bit closer at least to that area so I could slow down and really hit that section. So I don't know if there were people that were behind me that I just never saw. I, I never saw another competitor fishing the section of the river that I, that I was on. Dude, that's freaking, that's insane. Cause it seems like on the Shannon, I, on the Shannon Doe, it's such a narrow, small river compared to like the, up, the, the main stem of the upper Potomac or the Susquehanna or something like that. And I'm kind of shocked at how few competitors were on top of each other during that event. When there were so many guys, it seemed like they picked the Shenandoah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was another reason why I chose kind of trying to get out that early launch, too, was because if there were people coming to that section of river, I wanted to be ahead of them. I wanted to be hitting kind of the, the spots that I like before anyone else, at least fishing that tournament, had hit them. So that was another reason why I really wanted to do that that early launch, too. Uh, what were your expectations? If I fish this whole schedule, granted, okay, I did have sleeters on it this past year, but so minus sleeters like on the schedule, I would be feeling I would be feeling pretty shitty if I was on the Shenandoah river and I would have expectations that this is where I'm going to do damage. You know, Lake Anna, I would be like, Oh, this is awesome. This is a little lottery ticket, but the Shenandoah is where I'm going to do damage. Where was your head at leaving this event? I wanted to win this one. That was the, that was the one at the start of the year where I was, cause I debated jumping into this one uh, last year and uh, just doing that one. Um, I, I legitimately thought I had a chance to win it with just kind of the history that I had there. Um, it was the only tournament that I had that level of confidence going into it. But, you know, I've got 20 plus years of experience fishing the Shenandoah. And uh, I got onto a very specific bite in pre-fishing. And it was uh, it was a bait that I, I don't feel like a lot of other people th- are throwing, at least that exact variation of it. So the, the pre-fishing bite that I did was, you know, I caught some on a Ned Rig, caught some on a Fluke. And then eventually I switched over to uh, it's a localish bait company down in uh, i think they're based out of waynesboro virginia but it's uh river rock uh, custom baits oh yeah they, yeah so they have a gented or a, uh a jointed jerk bait soft plastic jerk bait and i was crushing them on it absolutely crushing them on it i could switch to about any other lure that i normally hammered out there on and i would catch fish but i was always a little bit smaller and then it seemed like no matter what as soon as i switched to that jerk bait I started catching better quality fish. Um, and that's, you know, I think those Shenandoah river fish, I think they see so many flukes. I think they see so many Ned rigs. So just something at least slightly different, I, I think was definitely helping out. So I, I had a lot of confidence going into that event. What do you think changed? What do you think changed with what? Going from that fluke bite. And then I think it was one on a buzz bait, which I didn't see that coming at all. I think a buzz bait was a main player. You have the confidence. Okay, the fluke. I got the secret bait. No one's throwing this. You get in there, and you're we, and you you have to make audibles. And so, what kind of audibles were you making? What do you think changed from your initial execution of the plan to as the day progressed? Yeah. So my original plan was I was going to get up and uh, right as the, the tournament hit and lines were in, I was going to start by throwing a, a Berkeley Chapo, and I was getting hammered on it, but I was I was not catching quality fish, and that was something that really threw me off because yeah, that's surprising. Like speaking too. that. Generally speaking, that early topwater bite, I mean, that's when you catch your better fish. Um, and it was not the case for me. So I did not stick with it for that long. I did about 45 minutes of it. And I think I caught like 10 or 15 shorts. And I'm like, this is not this is not the, the, the play. So I switched to that jerk bait really early in the morning. And uh, one of the first places that I hit, I had like an 18 and then a few more 15s. And then it was, uh, it definitely didn't play out the way that I wanted it or expected it to was, uh, 
the stretch of river that I really thought I would hammer it on, I really kind of stopped getting bit in that section and really didn't slow down all that much in it. Um, the Shenandoah River, with the exception of the winter, I am not going to slow down and fish all these areas, areas super thoroughly. Um, I'm just going to go and I'm going to cover as much water as I can and try and hit as many pockets, as many eddies, as many current seams as I can on my way down. Um, during the winter, that's a totally different thing. But, you know, that time of year, I was just trying to cover as much water as I could. And I didn't really slow down in that section that I really thought I would hammer it in. And I really wasn't getting bit. And I ended up doing way better way upstream and then way better downstream of it. Um, I was leading kind of off and on throughout the tournament. And then uh, I ended up falling to, I believe it was fifth in that yeah, fifth. Because. Um, and guys, you're probably thinking, like, well, Tom, you know, you're saying that he dropped a fifth. Like, what are you saying? Like, this is not really worked out. It's different when it's your home water. And it's, it's such a weird, I don't know how to explain this. When you go to these off the wall places like the Shenandoah or Sleater's Lake for me, the expectations you put on yourself and the time you have, it just plays with your mind where it's like, I expect to catch 90 inches or whatever because of the history. And you have to work yourself through that of how do I make adjustments? Because you do get in your head. Like I can't bomb on my home water. That's going to look bad. And it's so weird compared to like, if I go to a lake I've never known before, I just don't have the pressure on me versus a situation like this. Yeah. And it was, uh, I had a chance to win that tournament. I had what it would have been enough to get me back into the first. And I actually think it would have been my personal best small mouth too, that I lost right at the kayak, which I never would have expected to come. You know, that was kind of, it's not middle of the summer, but you're almost getting into the kind of that early summer where the fishing, you start to catch a lot more smaller fish on the Shenandoah. So I really wasn't expecting it. Um, and it was just a combination of a lot of bad things happening all at once. I was drifting down a section of ripples and I kind of made like a little short pitch cast and, uh, I hadn't fished it much of the day, but the bite had got a little bit slower. So I was just switching up a little bit and I was throwing one of the stealth blade jackhammers and I just made kind of a short pitch kind of at the, the current line as I was floating down the ripples. And I mean, it hit the water. I did like three cranks and I mean, it just shot that out of it and it just charged the kayak. And between me moving, the fish charging me and it was just kind of like a short little catch. I was also like kind of starting to turn in my kayak. I just could not reel in the slack enough to really get a good hook set in it. Um, but it shot like basically directly underneath my kayak and then jumped. Whereas if I would have been holding my net, I could have just like stuck my arm out and netted the thing out of the air. Like that's how close this thing jumped to me. Um, but it was uh, as soon as it jumped, it, it spat the hook and got off. But I don't like to put weights on fish that I didn't catch, but I would feel relatively confident in saying that was a six pound small mouth, which is not something I've ever seen in the Shenandoah that time of year. I've caught a lot of fives in the winter and uh, kind of in the spring, um, but I've never hit that six pound mark. And I, I really think that one had a chance to hit that six pound mark, which is just kind of a freak for the Shenandoah at that time of year. And that's, I mean, you know, that's awesome to hear for the river. I mean, it's definitely on the uptick, guys. It's really improving. And then with Halliker and what they're doing at the Front Royal Fishery, which, you know, sp spoilers, I actually am going to be meeting up with Halliker here in a, in, a, in a hot minute here in a couple of weeks to talk about the <clears throat> the Front Royal Fish Hatchery because they do have smallmouth. They are stocking smallmouth now in the Shenandoah River. We're going to get more detail on that later, more to come. But back to the tournament here, Lake Anna, banger. Don't have to worry about the Potomac. That one goes away. No problem. We don't have to worry about that. Shenandoah, it wasn't a home run, but it was a solid triple. When does it get into your mind? And I've gotten to interview so many Angler of the Year guys and the BFLs and stuff this year. And it's like, it's what point or do you think about it? Like, oh shit, this is a thing I'm doing now. It's like a perfect it, game almost. It didn't hit me until way later because the way that this tournament set up, and it was one of the main reasons why I wanted to fish tournaments is I have so much experience on the Shenandoah. I can go out and catch fish on the Shenandoah whenever I want. Like, I, I, you know, it's almost impossible for me to get skunked out there. It happens to everybody. It happens to me. I'm no exception. But when I have so much confidence, it's so hard for me to go some other places. So one of the main reasons why I jumped in this was to force myself to fish some different bodies of water, learn some different, different techniques, learn some different styles of fishery. So that was one of the main reasons why I got into it. But so af after we hit that Shenandoah River tournament, I had never been on any of these bodies of water except for the classic, which we didn't know the location of uh, yet at that time. Um, but so I, I really had no expectations going forward because I didn't know what to expect in any of those bodies of water. Even the battles of the five lakes, the only one of the battle of the five lakes lakes that I had been on, which is 10 lakes in total was Lake Frederick. And when I saw that one on, I knew I wasn't going to Lake Frederick. I, I did not <laughs> care for Lake Frederick. So, uh, bless the three people that decided to pick that lake. Um, I mean, let's get right into it then, because that that was the next stop on there was the Battle of Five Lakes uh, Part One. 
Uh, off the top of my head, it was uh, Aquaquan, Sleeters, Frederick, and was it Lake? Not Lake Brittle. I, no one else fished those lakes. It was lakes, supposed I don't to think. be Beaver Dam, but then Beaver Dam wasn't open, and they changed it to Germantown. Was one of the ones for that one. Germantown, yes, got it, got it. So, I mean, what were you gonna do? Because, like you said, you're not gonna pick Frederick. But one of the things I looked at was honestly just the size of some of those bodies of water, and Sleater being one of those small, si- smaller sizes of water. Um, I only had one day to pre-fish. There's five lakes. I didn't want to pick somewhere that was going to have a lot to break down. So I fished, picked one of the smaller ones. It was closer to my house than some of the other ones too. Um, and I had heard some decent things about it and done a little bit of research where it seemed like it was, it would, it would fish similar to the way that I would like it to. I'm not a big fishing out deep. I can do it when I need to be, but I knew there was, uh, so supposed to be a lot of grass in that lake. So that was one of the reasons why I went and picked that lake. Um, I pre-fished it for one day and I didn't kill it, but I had, had a pretty good day. Um, I saw what I, was without a doubt my biggest largemouth I've ever seen that day. Um, it was, uh, it's the only largemouth I had ever seen that I could actually physically see the giant bulging eyes on it. Um, and it came falling out a buzz toad out of one of the set of pads. And that was kind of all I needed to see at that point. I'm like, I'm coming back here. Like this is where I will be at tournament morning. Um, so that was my, my game plan going into it. I caught them on a little bit of everything pre-fish and I caught a lot kind of flipping, uh, just a creature bait on some of the edges, caught some on a chatter bait, just kind of your standard grass fishing type of stuff. I'm trying to think about the bike. I didn't, I never saw you on, or I was too locked in on, on game. So we were, we were next to each other for a little bit on, uh, we? on Sleeters when we were down near the route seven bridge, when you were fishing the kind of the deeper grass, I was pushed up along kind of the side closer to the route seven bridge. Were, were those the pads that you were fishing or is it the other corner? The other, the other Creek guard. I was right by the ramp. That big that one was, was right. By, I actually did really well right by the ramp. I caught three keepers without, I could never turn my trolling motor on, barely paddled. I have a like a stakeout pole that I have on my kayak, and I went down and I stakeout pulled, and I caught three keepers within you know twenty feet of the ramp that tournament morning. Yeah, that that, that creek. Arm, I saw the big one too. Was out of that initial set of pads. So that creek arm there, where we launched from, that used to be a pond before they filled the lake in. And so there's a reverse there's a reverse edge if you go back there a little bit more, where it comes up and then back down because that's where the dam used to be. Um, so that place is that place is really good, and I was shocked at. I thought there'd be a few kayaks, but oh my God, when there was a line in the morning, I did not expect it to be an aquarium. I was shocked any of us caught a decent yeah, limit. I, I had a little stomach river PTSD at that, at that launch that morning. <laughs> that was yeah. absurd. I was not expecting that many people to be at Sleater, especially with it being such a small body of water. How did that day go for you then? Like, like you said, it was like one here, one there. Did you get your limit early? Did you get it late? No, I got a limit pretty late. I had a, a decent, I think I had three decent ones that were all, I want to say around 15, kind of all right by the ramp. And then I just kind of started running all over. I found some in one of the coves, uh, flipping a creature bait during pre-fish. And I went back in there and then I caught one. And then I just kept catching shorts and I had four and I had a really, really hard time catching that fifth one. And then eventually that was when I went to the section uh, all the way down at the, uh, where the, the grass is at by the Route 7 bridge. And I uh, ended up catching a few over there and called a few times and caught a limit. And uh, I caught some dragging a light Texas rig kind of over top of some of the submerged grass. And then uh, the better one that I had that I ended up keeping in my limit, I caught on uh, one of the big blade chatter baits. Um, and I had that with a rage crawl just because it falls a little bit slower and you can kind of work it over the top of those that grass a little bit more than some of the, like a jackhammer that'll kind of bury down a little bit quicker. With that big blade, it just kind of has a little bit more of a flutter and a little bit slower fall. So I was working that, just kind of hopping it off the top of some of those submerged grass. And that's how I ended up catching my limit down there. Especially with that stringy grass, it's so, it's almost like a spider web. It's very sticky. And you really have to pick your baits correctly because the hydrilla, milfoil, couldn't tell. You can kind of rip stuff out of it, but that stuff, no, it's it's hard. Yeah, it was it was hard. I, was, I started out with a 3 8 ounce in Texas rig over there, and it was just like pulling in muck. So I ended up downsizing everything a lot and fishing, you know, as light as I, I had in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the tale of that place. And then, so, I mean, dude, I mean, at this point, again, uh, top 10, uh, you know, 70.75 inches. Now we got, we're going back to, we're going to the wrap. Tidal River 2.0 here. No experience on the wrap, correct? So, did you pre-fish? Did you say, like, screw it, we're just going to go in blind, see how it goes? I pre-fished one day in two different spots. Um, I checked out Port Royal, which was just... 
a giant massive grass flat and I just kept catching blue cats and missing snakehead and uh, went and checked out a different section a little bit further up and I found two spots. I didn't find much, but there's two spots that I found I was confident in. One was uh, kind of the mouth of one of the creeks and then I was actually catching them way further back in this creek than what I ever would have expected to catch them. Um, so that was where I was actually planning on starting. And then there was just another grass edge kind of on the other side of the river directly across from that creek arm that just had a long line of, uh, of grass. And then there was like a, a dock that I was catching some fish on with it too. And uh, that was my plan tournament morning. I was going to go hit that creek and then I was come back out and just going to milk that grass line all day long and uh, hope for the best with it. Um, caught them on a little bit of everything that day too. Caught some on a chatterbait, caught some flipping uh, creature bait. But a lot of the same stuff that I did sleeters, just the, on the wrap hand. What is your experience then with, I mean, two tournaments in a row doing the exact same thing, but you said you're a Shenandoah boy. Is this something that you learned in the Shenandoah or is it something you picked up somewhere else? It's some of it just from really these last few years playing around on the Potomac. And I, I've never really had a phenomenal day on the Potomac. I, I've had some decent days. Um, it's by no means am I a, a title a title person. I, if I have a good day on the Rappahannock even or on any tidal body of water and I'm in my bass boat, I am not running the tides. Like I'm not doing the milk runs, running all over the place. If I'm going to have a good day on any tidal bias of water, I'm slowing down. And once I catch one fish, I'm just really going to slow down and start really picking that section apart. Um, and I kind of picked that up from a little bit of my experience on the Potomac, just how concentrated a lot of these fish get mm -hmm. in a lot of these grass mats. And then, you know, pre-fish and catch a few and really kind of leave them alone and come back as long as those few that I catch are at least the right quality. Yeah. It's so funny how it is a cult. I think it's a cultural difference. Like where you, where you grow up different places, you, you pick up the customs and when you're fishing big, thick, grassy places, Potomac river, Florida, this idea of going slow and you pick it apart. You know, if you have a bass boat, you're power pulling down every 30, 40 feet, you work it, you go slow. And then I had a guy on like Blake miles, great angler who likes more of that running gun style. And it's such a, it, to me, it's just instinctual. Like, yeah, you got to slow down, but there are people where if you're not used to that, it's, it's so simplistic of a thing that you can move too fast on the Rappahannock. You can move too fast on the Potomac, but we grow up with it here, you know, for more, for more or less. And it's just so interesting. Cause like, yeah, I, I wouldn't think twice about, yeah, you can't just scoot. You gotta, you gotta be thorough. But on the Rappahannock, you did it better than all but two of the other guys. So it worked out very well. <laughs> yeah, it was, a uh, someone else kind of saved my butt in, in that tournament. Cause, uh, I know a lot of people went into the creek that I wanted to start in and I didn't get as early of a launch as I wanted to in that one. And as soon when I went to what was going to be my number one spot, there was a kayak sitting on the mouth of it. So I, I just went to spot two. And that, I mean, that first spot that I had, I mean, it got hammered. There was a bass boat tournament that went out of the, the same ramp that I went out of. And as soon as he left, it was just nonstop boats coming in out of there. Um, and it just got absolutely hammered. Um, I didn't move for the first about two and a half hours. I stake out, pulled down on this section of this grass flat. And it was something, I didn't even find this pre fishing I actually found it tournament morning. Um, I knew that there, I was catching fish along that grass, but I don't think I really understood exactly what I was catching them on. Cause I was not trying to beat them up. I know a lot of people, they do the taking hooks out and different things for like free fish. And that's not me. I'm I, like, I want to catch every fish that, that I can. Um, so like, I, I'm just going to not try and blow the spot up. Right. Um, so I caught a few out of it and then I was like, okay, it's a good spot. I'll come back to it. But there was a small point in the grass that came out and it was not much, but they were really, really relating to that small point in the grass that came out just an extra like three feet. How did you figure that out? Is it visual or it was a, it wasn't visual. It wasn't that it was still submerged at that point. It wasn't topped out. And it was just the more I kind of fished it, I could just feel it just from fishing over top of it and feel kind of where it was coming out at and stuff. Um, and then I, I caught a lot on that. I caught a lot on a chatterbait. I had a two 18s on back to back cast. Um, and then I lost another one like shortly after that. Um, and then I just kind of slowly, slowly worked down that after that point. But I didn't move for the first two and a half hours. And then after that, all I would do is I would pick up my stakeout pole. I would let me let myself drift with the current about 10 to 15 feet, stick that thing back down on the ground, and just really slowly fish that section. And uh, all of my fish came in about a 75-yard stretch of river. 
Dude, well done. I mean, that's freaking that's freaking awesome execution there. And the devil in the detail. You just you picked up on something just a little bit different, and then you also executed on everything else when it came to landing fish. And that's what it comes down to. Seventy four inches. Uh, Scott Skinner, guys, I had him on the show already. You know, seventy nine. We're kind of getting into the season here. I got to know, like, we got one left event left. Are you thinking about it yet? This is where it hit me. Yeah, this is this is the one where. It- I still had never been on any of these bodies of water at all. Knew nothing about uh, really any of them. Um, so it was, didn't have a ton of expectations, but I was like, this is the point where I'm like, oh my God, I actually have a shot at this. And it was like my goal going into this year. And it was like, uh, Mike asked me when uh, at the award ceremony where I won rookie of the year is like, you know, what was kind of my mindset going into this? And I just didn't want to suck. Like that was really my goal. I wanted to force myself to learn new bodies of water. I'm competitive. I want to win everything. But as far as, expectations i had no expectations going into the season minus the shenandoah river event because even you know i have some experience on the potomac i'm not a potomac river person i don't claim to crush the potomac river i have some experience on lake anna i've been somewhat inconsistent on lake anna don't claim to be a, a lake anna person um so really it was really only one event where i was like i really think i have a chance to win this going into it and uh going into this last event that's where it really hit me i was like I have a chance at this, especially with uh, with the format that they do for MBKBAs. You drop your lowest event. Um, so at this point, I had all top ten events going into the final with it dropping my Potomac. And, and, uh, like, and I'm getting that one up right now, which is the, uh, the 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 final Battle of Five Lakes tournament here. And okay, cool, because I know Josh Ree's 85.75 inches for that one. Just a little prelude. So uh, uh, Mooney Abel. Mott's Run, Nye, Hunting Run, you know, the big Fredericksburg area lakes. Never been there. Shit ton of lakes to pick from. How'd you Never pick? been on any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I've never really heard of most of them, to be honest with you. There's a lot <laughs> of the other ones. Like, I never, I've still never been on the res, um, but I know kind of how it fishes just from hearing about it so much. And uh, I didn't go to the res this year the first time around. I went to Sleater just because, like I said, I only had that one day to pre-fish. And I know that there's that one kind of has that reputation of that forward facing sonar a little bit more offshore and just didn't really feel confident in my ability to break that down in one day of pre-fishing and then just hoping for the best tournament morning. Um, so I, I, this is the most I had pre-fished for any event up in the year, pretty much every event except for this one. It was really about a day of pre-fishing for, for all of them. Um, this one I did, a half a day on Mooney starting out in the morning. And then I switched and went to uh, half a day at Abel. Um, Mooney was weird. It's a, uh, it's definitely, I think the best lake out of these, but it is such a unique lake because you know, you, where you launch at, there's a lot of grass kind of right by the ramp. And then I went out from that a little bit deeper and there's the first Island that you come to, you know, I'm casting distance away from this Island. And I looked down at my graph and I'm like, I'm in a hundred feet of water. <laughs> it's like, it's such a weird body of water. It's so deep. And then the grass in, in Mooney also, it grows really, really deep too. Um, so I, I pre-fished in there for a little bit and I had some bites, but I wasn't on anything great. I was catching some on a drop shot, um, caught a few on a wacky rig and just a little bit of everything. And then, uh, I ended up getting onto a decent bite at Mooney, but it wasn't a bite that I felt confident in. I ended up going up like really shallow my day pre-fishing. Um, but my day pre-fishing was about a week and a half before the tournament. And it was a day after a full moon and there was a bunch of bluegill beds and I was starting to catch some related to bluegill beds, but I didn't feel like that bite was still going to be there in a week and a half. I figured that all of those fish would kind of be pushing off. Um, so that was why I, I ended up changing and going to Able and just kind of checking it out. Um, Abel was weird too. It's another really steep, uh, body of water. It's, you know, it's basically bluff walls. It sets up like a river with essentially bluff walls and a little bit of uh, shoreline vegetation. Um, a lot of it. Um, and it was, uh, it's kind of a unique fishery with, with at least the pattern that I found. It was all the grass there. It looks so good. You really feel like you should be able to hammer them in the grass. I couldn't get it, but I could not get bit in the grass. Hmm. Um, so what I ended up doing is, they're not like necessarily brush piles, but it's like deep, it's deep wood because the banks are so steep on those laydowns fall. They don't like fish like a traditional laydown. They end up going basically straight down into the water and then you end up. Yeah. yeah. So they fish kind of weird. And it was, uh, there's definitely a thermocline that I found on my graph there that was relatively really? shallow um, and about 15 feet of water. So what I ended up, it took me a while to kind of get, you know, dialed into it, but I thought it was crappy that I was seeing suspended up off of the top of these brush piles they were setting up very, very um, vertical the way the crappy do off of the top of brush piles. 
And I didn't really slow down and fish a ton of them, but then it was, I ended up slowing down and fishing them. I was like, oh, these are bass suspending up off the top of them. And I think the reason they were suspended up off of them so much is because a lot of them, they would fall down and would go into, you know, 25, 30 feet of water and a lot of that, but that thermocline would hit and then they would sit kind of in the top half of the, the really deep lay down up over the top of it, over the thermocline suspending up off of it. Um, so I did one other day of pre-fishing just because I wanted to see some of the other bodies of water. And I did another half a day at, uh, at Hunting Run. And I liked the way the Hunting Run set up, but there was just so many people out there. My one day of pre-fishing, um, I mean, it was legitimately like hard to fish. Um, and I got there pretty early and I was just bass boats. And I didn't really see anything that looked like it would be anyone from NVKBA. I knew that that was going to be one of the, at least a little bit more popular lakes. So with the amount of boat traffic that I saw, and I was there on like a Wednesday or something. Um, so I'm like, if I come here on a weekend and there's all of these people out along with MBKBA people, it's just going to be a ton of people. Um, I'm going to go to Able because I didn't really see much pressure at Able compared to any of the other ones. And uh, I kind of like the way it's set up. There's a smaller body of water. Um, so I did half a day of hunting run, got a couple bites, didn't get anything in the boat, went back to Able. And my plan was I was just going to mark as much of that deep wood as I could. And uh, I ended up with 17 of those kind of really deep lay downs marked on my graph. And uh, kind of ran back over and made sure I could still catch some fish off of them. And then I just went and spent the rest of the day just graphing, and marking them. And that, that was going to be my plan for tournament day. I had 17 of them. I was just going to rotate through and make, you know, it's it's a straight line, right? It just kind of sets up like a river. And I was just going to go back, start it there, hit all 17 on my way there. And I was going to, if I don't know how much time I had, just keep making that loop back through them. That's pretty ballsy because I know, I mean, hunting around a course, I think of all the lakes in Frederick, I think that's the most well known um, to just the average person. And then, of course, I think Mooney's where, where Reese actually ended up winning it. But to, to, to make that pivot, that's pretty gutsy there. And, and based on what you said earlier, there wasn't a lot of anglers that picked that lake. And I, Gerald Swindle said something funny a long time ago where it's like you get to a spot and you're all alone. It's either like, ha, I'm going to win this or, oh, shit, what I do wrong? <laughs> are you, are you, did you find the money stuff or are you just so far out in left field that uh, you probably made a mistake? And so getting into that tournament then, did, did, did it come hot and heavy early? Did you have to grind yeah. for it? No, it was an absolute grind, that tournament. I rotated through all 17 and didn't catch a keeper started rotating back my way towards the ramp through all 17 again, fished a little bit of the grass kind of in between after I wasn't getting bit on any of the wood. I was like, okay, maybe they started pushing up into the grass. Really wasn't getting bit on that either. And then I was kind of got into a little bit of a panic. I mean, I think it was noon and I had one fish um, and there was one fish that I had caught some shorts out of. And I'm like, I'm just going to go back to that. It was, uh, I had seen stuff on my fish finder. It just, it, it didn't seem like it was, I'm not, I don't claim to be an expert with, uh, with my graphs. I run a Garmin 73, uh, SV, but it was just what I was seeing. Didn't seem, it seemed like they should be bigger fish than what I was catching. I was catching like eight, nine inches out of this brush pile. Um, and what I was seeing, I, I felt like it should have been better quality. So I'm like, let me go back through that. Let me really milk that. And it, it's set up in a good spot. Um, especially for in the afternoon, kind of in the afternoon, the wind started picking up in that point. It was a, a deep lay down that kind of set up almost like a brush pile, but it was right on a point right with current going over top of it. So I'm like, I'm just going to really slow down and fish this one super thoroughly. Um, so when I also got some decent bites out of uh, pre-fishing too, and I caught a limit all out of that same one. And uh, I didn't move for, I think an hour and a half. I did the exact same thing, just stake out, pull down and really pick that thing apart. And uh, I caught a few on a lot of different things. I caught some deep cranking and just banging it off of the tops of the branches, caught a few doing that. I caught some working a jerk bait over top of it. And then eventually I switched to a 10 inch worm and started working it kind of down a little bit deeper in, just really trying to just absolutely pick this thing apart as much as I could. Cause the only thing I really had confidence in at that point. And uh, it ended up squeezing out a limit towards the end, uh, all out of that same brush pile. Dude. I mean, that's, it's a hell of a year. I mean, I, I, it's a hell of a year. <laughs> 72.75 inches, 14th place. I mean, if you get rid of the Potomac, which which ends up happening, that is just remarkable. And especially when you think about so many of these lakes, you just didn't have time to actually practice on. Now, with all that said, it, it's a great cap to the year if, if it was the end of the story, but it's not. We have a championship to go to, which is on Lake Anna, which goods and bads here. It's the fact that you've already been there. I thought that the neat little hiccup here, and I'm glad I got you on to talk about this, was the tournament was pushed. Yep. 
How did that affect everything? I don't know. I think it affected my pattern a little bit more than what some of the people that I talked to, because the bite that I found, it was a lot of people that, you know, ended up doing well, was kind of your standard fall fishing. And they, and it's weird. I mean, they go from as shallow as a foot to as deep as like 25 in the fall. I mean, it is just, they are so scattered all over the place, just chasing bait wherever they want to be. Um, at least from what I have seen. And uh, the bite that I got on was, way back in the back of contrary creek and i was it was all hydrilla fish it was it was the only thing that i had a ton of confidence in um and i pre-fished some up in the splits didn't have a, anything to worth going back to and then ended up going into contrary you know, before it got postponed and uh i didn't go there until the day before the tournament and it was a lot of people had phenomenal days on the water. So was, I think I got a little bit of a false sense of security and how great that place was because there's a lot of people who just had phenomenal days all over the lake that I talked to. Um, but it was probably the best day of fishing I've ever had in my life. Um, I only fished for about two hours, but I had every bit of over a 20 pound bag in those two hours. Um, I had a six, five, I had a few over four and it was on a little bit of everything. Um, but it was all relating to grass. I was catching them on a swim jig. I was, uh, I was back in uh, another part of the creek where there's some hydrilla up underneath of the docks, but it's not matted out. And I was skipping a buzz bait up underneath some of the docks, catching fish doing that. I mean, it was, I could do anything I wanted back in that grass and I was getting hammered all over it. So I was like, this is where I'm going. I stopped after about two hours just so I wouldn't wear out the fish a ton. And uh, then the tournament got postponed. As soon as that happens, like, what is your, are you going to pre-fish it again? Or are you just going to say, screw it. I'm going to live or die in this area no matter what. Like, how'd that change your strategy? So I was going to try and get out at least a day and just see, because we were kind of in that point of the year where I knew there was a chance where grass would start dying off. We're right kind of at that point where there, I was worried about that. And I went back in and I went back all the way to the back of Contrary Creek. And what I was finding was the grass that's actually in Contrary Creek was starting to die off. And then I wasn't finding anything relating to it. I was able to go a little bit further back where there's a creek that comes into it. And uh, I was still finding some green grass back there. I pre-fished it. I got uh, one bite that I didn't land. And then, but I, all the grass I was finding was still mostly green, right? There was still a little bit where the tops of it were starting to get a little bit brown, but I was able to find some good isolated patches. And uh, my hope was just, I would be able to go back in there and it would really congregate the fish into that little bit of healthy grass that was left. Um, that's what I did tournament morning and those fish got out of the grass. I mean, there was, I didn't see anything. There was no activity. There was no bait fish moving around. It just seemed like as soon as that grass started to die, they got out of there. And uh, I had about a four mile run in a kayak all the way to the back of that creek. And uh, I tried to save it for a lot of the day back there, um, just kind of fishing some of that a little bit more isolated, still good grass. And then that didn't work. I'm like, I'm already back here. I don't really have time to run out of this creek in a kayak get anywhere else so i started trying to fish some docks and stuff on the way out it was a uh, raining windy not a great day um, but i was hoping that the poor weather would make the fish bite because you know traditionally speaking i feel like lake annie you get bad weather you get decent fishing um but that was not what i found and it wasn't what a lot of people found from from what i saw um, checking the leaderboards at that point there weren't a ton of people that really seemed to be hammering them um, but the fish that i caught on the way out of that creek i mean it was they're all shorts i didn't catch a single creeper keeper on my way out but they're just all over the place. It was like, you know, there's some kind of out in front of the docks, which I kind of expected. I didn't catch, expect to catch them like way up underneath a dock when it's raining and windy. Um, so I caught some on a small swim bait out in front of some of the docks. I caught some off of uh, some of those secondary points and stuff like that. But I just could not get a keeper fish. I mean, it was, I think I caught four or five on my way out and they were all between nine and 11 and a half inches. And then uh, eventually I went into uh, to Pigeon Run and started fishing secondary points in there too. And uh, a ton more bait in there, a ton more bait. I really wasn't seeing much bait in Contrary Creek either. So I think that was a, another factor in why the fishing wasn't great in there. And I started getting bit consistently in Pigeon Run, but I only had about an hour or so to fish it. Um, so I really only fished about two, two and a half secondary points, but I think I caught like 11 fish off of them. But it was, I was just running into that same thing. It was a lot of shorts. It was a lot of, uh, and was, a lot of the bites, they were just so, so subtle and I was just barely barely cranking a little three inch uh, paddle tail swim bait trying to get it underneath some of these schools of bait fish and they felt like bluegill bites I and mean, they would come in and just peck 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 and then eventually they would actually get the whole thing in their mouth so it was a, by no means were they out there crushing any of this stuff um but it was a 
I only ended up with one keeper fish and I ended up like 29th out of 30 worst event of the year. Uh, definitely not, not the end that I, I was hoping for, but did that, did the fish that you get matter though? Like what if you finished 30th? I don't think it would have mattered. Yeah. It, it did. I didn't want to get skunked. Right. Like it was, it was like proud me. I it was like, I'm not going to win this thing, but I'm not trying to get skunked. Like I'm going to catch a fish. <laughs> and, and in the end, like you had it wrapped up. I mean, you, you did absolutely amazing on the year. Like Anna's is hard to begin with. And, it's so funny because around here it just feels like fall always happens later than what Bassmaster magazine says and so you get september really is that weird transition all the way through october because usually i mean i you know i was talking to jeff green um a week ago i guess it'll be a, it'll be yeah a week ago so guys the jeff green episode has already dropped by now so you probably heard this but we're talking about how like the fall transition is just it's so much later november is basically the fall you know and everyone thinks november because of corporate American marketing, like, no, that's winter time. It's like, not, not for fishing. That's still the fall bite. That's when the fish, I think really get into that feed bag mentality because you're not having this transition of it's still hot in early October. You got the rain, you got the hurricanes and crap. That's a long way of saying that like the lake and at that time, it's tough. It really is. And you know, guys, I just had this up here because I, I really want to talk about that. Uh, 16th place had like 48 inches. And so if you divide that by five, that's a nine inch average for five fish, just for people at home that are listening in. So that's a tough tournament. <laughs> that's a real tough. No, tournament. no one really crushed it that day. I was at least really happy to see. So Victor, the guy, the guy who won the classic, he was the guy who I had a, a slight lead on in AOY, um, before that event and he won it and he, you know, pretty much smacked him that day. So that did at least make me feel better. Right. Like the guy that I was ahead of by a little bit won it so i was like for me to even have a chance like i would have had to have a really good day had i lost it by like a couple inches it definitely would have stung at least a little bit more not that i'm happy with finishing 29th out of 30 but uh the fact that victor came out and smacked him and definitely would have made it really tough for me to win anyways definitely made it hurt at least a little bit less i think um and it, it was one of those things going into it too it was uh without the format of dropping it he would have been leading aoy anyway so he he overall at that point had had the better year so you know hats off to him because he crushed him all year long he had had a better year up going into that, and then he ended up smacking him in the classic. So he definitely had a good year. Definitely made it hurt a little bit less to, to lose the guy that was in second when he came out and cracked him. No, a hundred percent. Victor had a hell of a tournament and a hell of a year. And then, guys, just to kind of like to, to put a pin on that. So if you caught five twelve-inch fish, it basically got you right at eleventh place, maybe tenth place. So catching a a normal live well limit, a dinky one would have jumped you a lot. So. With that mindset, I guess you already knew going into that tournament, like, it's going to be a grinder. You just got to put stuff together, which, oh, that's amazing. But, dude, that's that's a heck of a year. A heck of your first year doing all this. So, I mean, with that said, what are your plans for next year? Like, how, how are you going to kind of double out what you did this year? So, I, I plan on fishing the MDKBA again. Um, for right now, I'm kind of excited to kind of get back into some musky fishing and stuff like that, too. I, I uh I do a lot of musky fishing on the Shenandoah and I can really completely gotten away from it. And, and I don't fish for him during the summer once that water gets hot anyways. Um, so I didn't really miss it that much, but I don't fish during the fall a ton these last couple of years, especially or if I am, it's going to be the Shenandoah. I, I just do not like a lot of these shad lakes and the way that they fish during kind of that fall transition spot. And that's usually about when the water is getting cool enough where you can start fishing for musky. So I didn't have a ton of experience doing it because I don't like to do it. And I would rather go chase musky that time of year. Um, but since we had this tournament, especially with it getting delayed, kind of forced me to fish that fall transition a little bit more, which, uh, I reiterate how much I hate following the, this last event too. Um, but definitely excited to get back into some musky fishing. I got out for, uh, the first time really, I think since like February, um, of this year and, uh, had a couple follows, didn't get up, end up anything that would eat, but it's, it's tough on the Shenandoah right now. It's so low and so clear. You'll get a lot of follows, but it's, it's tough to get them to commit right now. I had one follow that's probably somewhere between like 35, 38 inches. And then another one that was a small one, about like 25 inches or so. A couple more weeks. Usually I think around veterans days when the fishing starts picking up on the Potomac, Shenandoah, you know, all, all of the rivers around us. I think that's when it starts really picking up into the, my favorite time of year to fish, which is the winter time. Um, that's when you catch the, the donkeys. Yeah, it's a, uh... That's especially, that's why, especially the Shad Lakes, it's the Shandor River. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's not great. It's not lights out like it is some other places, but I've just never done great on a lot of these, uh, these Shad Lakes during that fall transition when stuff gets so related to, to chasing bait. And I think part of it is I get spun out with, 
okay, this creek's got so much bait and, you know, I need to be fishing, you know, around all this bait. And I kind of think I get spun out. Like they say, find the bait, find the bass. They say, find the bait, find the bass. And just kind of get that almost drilled into my head too much where I spend a lot of time chasing these bait balls. And it's one of those things that you get so much bait in an area, there's no reason for them to eat an artificial lure, mm -hmm. right? When they've got so much of the real thing, why are they going to smack your paddle tail swim bait? Um, well, and I think what's so nice is, you know, since I don't, you know, I'm, I'm getting back into tournament fishing, but you get to fish just what's hot. And, you know, lakes in the fall, I, I know some people like that, just that, that kind of run, but creeks, small rivers, those things are popping right now for small mouth and things like that. Go fish that. And then in the wintertime, fish rivers and lakes because i think lakes like like frederick in the winter time get an umbrella rig you'll, you'll catch a couple of donkeys so yeah th there's so many options around us yeah i've come close to putting a 100 pound that's my goal for for this winter is i want to get at least a 40 inch musky i've really only been doing the musky stuff hardcore for about a couple years I caught four uh, last year all out of shenandoah um but i want to get a 100 pound or 100 not 100 pound 100 inch limit that'd be a hell pound. of a musky <laughs> But uh, I've come close. I had a 99-inch uh, limit out of the Shenandoah last year. Um, missed it by three-quarters of an inch. So that, that that's kind of my goals for the year. Not for really anything tournament. Just get back into a little bit of musky fishing stuff. Really try and get uh, some good bags out of the Shenandoah and then uh, start fresh with MBKBA next year. Nate, I really appreciate you coming on. And, heck, we might have to do just a musky, uh, kayak musky episode here coming up in this wintertime about the Shenandoah because that's something um, – yeah, the musky fishing on the Shenandoah, guys, it's coming. It's it's yeah. getting there. Uh, so huge shout out to yeah. that. The There's a rumor that they're not going to stock muskies on the main stem anymore due to low survival rates. So uh, I reached out to one of the biologists about that. I'm still waiting to hear back. So be well, just about that. So we'll see. Well, since I uh, am going to be talking to one here shortly, I will ask him myself about that specifically. So th thanks for that. Because I know there's also supposedly flathead on the Shenandoah too. That I haven't had they... seen any of that. I don't fish super far down. I fish mostly kind of uh, the front royal stretch and the main stem. So I don't doubt that there's some more once you kind of get closer to Harper's Ferry and stuff like that. But I usually don't fish that far down. Yeah, I fished from I fished from Millville all the way up to front royal. Well, I, I grew up on I literally grew up on the main stem. So it, like it was like five seconds from my house. So I, I fished the whole thing back and forth. And, and if I think I've never caught a flathead. So I really hope that that's just a rumor and it's not true because Lord knows what they would do that place. But guys, that's probably something for another episode. Nate, <laughs> is, there anything, is there anything you want to pimp out sponsor wise? Anyone you want to give a shout out here to? No, I don't have any sponsors or anything like that. Uh, I do like giving a shout out to some of the, the local bait companies. Um, so for, uh, I, I'm not sponsored by them or anything like that, but river rock customs bait, like I would not have done as well in that, uh, that tournament on the Shenandoah without their jerk bait. So Definitely go check them out. I think they, they make a, a good quality of a lot of different things, but especially that that jointed jerk bait. It's definitely just a little bit different than those flutes that everybody else is throwing. Um, musky baits, I throw a lot of. Uh, it's a local bait company from a, a guy named Andrew I. Uh, he makes some really, really, really cool gliders. And uh, it's mostly draw to buy, kind of small batches, but he's on Facebook as a Spray Bomb Bait Company. So if you join that Facebook group, you can definitely go and find some uh, find some baits in there and they, they hammer them on the Shenandoah. It's a, it's a very refined glide on those. Um, so definitely go, go check those out if you're interested in guessing any uh, muskies out here. Guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Please give Nate a follow. And then I'm also going to link NVKBA. Uh, Mr. Ortega runs a hell of an organization. Uh, we've had some kind of weird uh, partnership, mutual relationship. I don't know what we call it. It's complicated. That's what we'll put it. It's a complicated <laughs> thing, but uh, for a long time now. So please go support that uh, organization. Like and subscribe to the channel, guys. And then, oh, and then our uh, our Patreon supporter of the episode right here is Mr. Crawford. Crawford, thank you so much for being a Patreon supporter. Guys, if you'd like to join us on Patreon, our main goal is to start a nonprofit so we can actually start help stocking some of these places ourselves so we can take it out of the government's hand. We can just do it ourselves. That's our long drive. That's our long term pipe dream, but we're going to get there eventually. Like and subscribe to the channel, guys, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.